Okay, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, fifth, fifth uh, um, appointment for our 40U40 lecture series. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Peng uh, Zhao, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Aerospace and Biomedical Engineering and Space Institute of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, in, in Knoxville, USA. Um, so he obtained his PhD at the Department of Mechanical in, uh, and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University in 2015. And between the 2015 to 2020, he was an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at Oakland University. Uh, so the research interests of Professor Peng Zhao uh, focus on fundamental based and uh, application oriented problems in the area of combustion, propulsion, energy conversion, and fire safety. Um, now his uh, research interests uh, include as well low carbon fuels, uh, lithium ion batteries, safety, multi-physical numerical simulations, and he has um, published in this area a significant number of uh, peer-reviewed articles. And uh, um, for people in the combustion community, um, probably know the Bernard Lewis Fellows is also a, a fellow and recipient of this very important recognition. So without uh, further ado, I would like to thank again uh, Professor Beng Zhao for accepting our invitation. And they will talk today about the role of combustion research in light lithium ion battery thermal runaway. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, good. Um, hello, everybody. It's my great honor and pleasure to speak at this e-series and thank you to, uh, thanks to the Belgium session of the Combustion Institute for providing a excellent platform for young scholars to, to communicate in a community. So today I wanna to talk about the role of combustion research in battery summer runway. And hopefully in, by the end of the talk, you can say how can combustion be, ver be adaptive towards the era of decarbonization and the electrification. So first of all, I wanna start with this uh, review paper about 16 years ago by my PhD advisor, Professor Sikri Law from Princeton, the former president of Combustion Institute. The reason I select this paper as a starting point is I sort of feel that the title is what I feel that the community is facing right now. And basically in this paper, the background was the funding at that time was down, uh, especially in the United States. The scientific vitality and relevance of combustion was being challenged. And also compared with some relatively new sciences like bio, info, nano, together with material science, and a lot of talents and funding resources are diverted. Right? And in the end of this research, paper and the author review some new opportunities for research in combustion. For example, combustion under extreme con conditions. The supers refers to supercritical, supersonic, and supergravity. And micros refers to micro engines, micro reactors, or micro thrusters. And also the authors pointed out that the interdisciplinary research uh, for between combustion and this new science field. Compared to what it was 16 years ago, I think we are receiving more challenges about combustion research, especially with a trend of decarbonization. But one thing that I feel that is not changed is about the evolving nature of the combustion. And that is also a point from the paper that I met the I mentioned. So basically in the paper it says, in addition of being a scientific discipline, combustion is an applied science, which constantly draws inspiration from different practical phenomena. As a result, combustion research objectives can be highly dynamic because they have to constantly be reframed and justified within a larger scope of the societal interests. But no matter the practical phenomena or societal interests, they are gradually evolving 
So therefore, combustion research objectives are constantly evolving. It's dynamic process. And the only healthy thing that maybe the community can do is to constantly evaluate the relevance of research activities and also the rigor of the intellectual content and also the future direction we want to go. So here I, I, I selected a, a figure that shows the top eight decarbonization trends and innovations. These results are, are listed in the top eight technologies related with decarbonization from a survey of more than 5,000 startup companies uh, around the globe. And as you can see that renewable energy, low carbon energy, carbon capture, uh, electric mobility, these are top issues that people are interested in. And actually, I feel that we're already doing a very good job for being adaptive, because if you say, if you read the recent literatures in combustion, you will be amazed like how many papers related with hydrogen and ammonia, right? That doesn't happen like two or three years ago. So I, I believe that crossroads is not a bad end. Crossroads can lead to more opportunities, okay? And in the era of uh, decarbonization and electrification, uh, a lot of, there is a, there's lots of interest on lithium ion batteries because of the, because of the, uh, because of that lithium ion battery now has a reasonable energy density, has a pretty stable uh, lifetime. And also it can be integrated with a low carbon elect electricity generation type technologies that allows centralized carbon capture and sequestration. So here shows the working principles and structures of batteries. As you can see that lithium ion battery includes current collector, uh, household material, separator, anode, and also current collector. And within this structure, it fills uh, electrolyte. So during the charging process, you can say that the, the, during the discharging process, the lithium ions migrates from the anode to the cathode internally. Well, the separators does not allow the electrons to pass. Therefore, the, the electrons will go through the external circuit and recombine with the lithium ion in the cathode. So the opposite process is observed during the charging process. And depending on the different chemistry, and there can be different cathode materials, like lithium phosphate, nickel manganese cobalt materials, lithium cobalt oxide, and nickel uh, cobalt aluminum, and lithium manganese oxide. There can be different anode materials as well. So these different batteries may have different performance as I summarize here. And recently there is a trend that, that the NMC cells is gradually evolving to those with higher nickel content, which leads to higher energy density. So from my understanding, I think that there are four primary challenges about lithium ion battery research. The first one is energy density. If you consider that the state of the art lithium ion battery has an energy density about 250 watt hour per kilogram, that's only about 2% compared with 45 megajoules per kilogram, a typical energy density for gasoline and diesel. So this limits the application for batteries to low to medium du duties. And uh, for large, for heavy duty applications, it basically will require tremendously large size of battery pack that further aggravate the slow charging issues. And the second thing is the Unlike the engines that can serve us for decades without a problem, but batteries is inherently subject to irreversible physical chemical change. We typically call this as degradation. This degradation can, can include the loss of active materials, the formation of physical structure in the particles, 
and also the lithium plating and dendrite that can be formed under high state rate charging or uh, low temperature charging conditions. The third thing is about the materials. In basic, similar to fossil fuels, there's only limited amount of lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese on Earth. So therefore, after the, the lifetime of the battery, there has to be some low cost, high efficient uh, methods to recycle the useful materials from the battery without further causing more pollutions in earth and water, right? And eventually, if, if, if there's no economical way to recycle the materials and the price of the battery will store up and eventually quench the fuel. The last one is what I'm going to focus on today's talk is on the sensitivity to temperature. So batteries like humans, it only functions well within the reasonable temperature range. Under low temperature conditions, it suffered from the sluggish chemistry and manifested with very high internal resistance and output power, very low output power. And our high temperature conditions, thermal runaway can be triggered. So from the thermal perspective, you can see that previous understandings about thermal runaway has shown that thermal runaway occurs in three periods. The first period is there is a heating source that gradually heat up the temperature of a cell to the onset condition where you, you observe some self heating phenomena, okay? And starting from the onset, you see accelerated temperature rise. And this is because the heat is not dissipated fast enough from the cell. So therefore, the more heat you release, the higher the temperature, then the more heat you release. That positive feedback eventually will drive the battery to another onset temperature we call thermal runaway onset. And starting from there, you can see much faster runaway behavior of the temperature of the cell, okay? And this typically accompanied with the vent, the vent event of the electrolyte with, gas, with gases and smoke and sometimes flames. Eventually, I, I think that the, this basically shows the thermal runaway has a very similar nature as the ignition problem. It's basically this phenomena can be explained using the widely known Seminova criterion. So it's basically, if you consider the chemical heat release has Arrhenius temperature dependence. And if you consider any cooling process give you a near linear uh, temperature dependence. And eventually the threshold condition is given by the tangential point of these two curves. And starting from there, and you can say that if any disturbance will give you a much faster increase of the chemical heat release compared with heat loss, right? So from the chemical kinetic perspective, I consider a charged battery contains a fuel and oxidizer internally. And what happens during summer runaway, and here gave you a very simple sandwich layer of lithium cobalt graphite batteries, where we, we can consider, say, the electrolyte fills a separator region that contains acetylene carbonate and some salt. What, what typically happens during summer runaway is at elevated temperature conditions, the SEI layer that formed at the first cycling tends to decompose. When once it decomposes, it generates the same carbonate, ethylene, CO2, and oxygen. And the lithium within the anode particles can directly react with the electrolyte. So that becomes a major exothermic reaction. At the same time, your cathode can decompose, become reduced metal oxide, release oxygen. And this oxygen can further combust with the organic component in the electrolyte. And furthermore, this organic component in the electrolyte and also salt can decompose by themselves. 
overall, these reactions, they can release a lot of heat and they generate lots of flammable gases and even have oxygen there. And recently, people have shown that there can be crosstalk reactions between the electrodes. So that means your lithium in the anode can react with the oxygen that's being generated from the cathode decomposition. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about three aspects of thermal runaway that based on my research experience from the combustion perspective. First part is on the modeling analysis. The second part is on the experimental testing. The last part is on the method to mitigate thermal runaway. So one of the most important concepts to evaluate a reacting mixture is the minimum ignition energy. Basically, it describes what is the amount of energy needed for, say, for a hot spot, for, for a hot spot or a spark to trigger a self-sustained flame in a reacting mixture. As you can see for this uh, rich oxygen, uh, hydrogen oxygen mixture, when you have ignition energy above a certain critical value, you can have successful triggering of the flame. So the question is now, in case there is a hot spot induced by local heating or internal shell circuit, what will be the minimum ignition energy for that hot spot to trigger some runaway? And the model we established it is rather simple. Assuming that this is a prismatic cell, then we can use a cylindrical region to mimic the heat release from a nail penetration procedure. For example, we can add a artificial uh, constant heat source within the cylindrical region that mimics the nail. Outside of the cylindrical region, we can consider the thermal runaway chemistry cross current. So, and so uh, compare with the very mature detail chemistry of fuel combustion, the chemical kinetics of the thermal runaway is, is still sort of in the infant stage, say we're still using very global reaction source terms to represent, for example, ICEI decomposition heat source, the reaction between the anode and electrolyte, reaction between the cathode and electrolyte, and electrolyte decomposition. And more recently, there, there has been more complicated thermal runaway mechanisms, including the effects of binder and other stuff. But still, it's, it's not in the detail level, it's in, it's in a semi-global, uh, level. So these parameters from these reactions, they can be logically quantified from the differential scanning calorimeter experiment. As you can see that with the appropriate parameters, this model can agree with certain experimental condition pretty well. So we're using the models of the lithium cobalt oxide uh, to do some simulations based on the configuration we have. What we do is basically we are changing different heat source intensity and duration in this cylindrical region to see if we can trigger some runaway. As you can see here in the case one, with this particular heat source intensity and duration time, some runaway successfully triggered. Starting from this point, by either reducing the heat source intensity or the duration time, that we're not going to have thermal runaway, as seen in this green curve and this blue curve. So that means the threshold condition for hot spot induced thermal runaway corresponds to a pair of critical heat source intensity and duration time. By identifying many different pairs of the critical conditions and connecting them, we now come up with a regime diagram for thermal runaway. So below this curve, it's rather safe. The hot spot cannot induce some runaway because of either low heat source intensity or short duration time. And beyond this regime boundary, we are in the we are having the risk of thermal runaway. And also we can use uh, kinetic analysis as what we did in combustion to compare the thermal 
and uh, concentration profiles in the case with and without thermal runaway. The comparison basically shows the, the reaction between the anode and the electrolyte plays a very important role. And also even we can do sensitivity analysis as what we did well, anal uh, analyzing ignition delay time in combustion research. We can, we can identify what are the important parameters in the model that are affecting the delay time for thermal runaway. So more details can be found in this previous work. And compared with thermal runaway triggering, the thermal runaway propagation has a greater risk because that means you, you can have thermal runaway propagate to a nearby cell and nearby pack. That's going to be leading to a fire hazards in a greater scale, right? So previous experiment, basically by using, uh, by embedding thermocouples in the lithium ion battery packs and trigger thermal runaway at a certain cell, they basically observe that there is sort of wave propagation behavior. All this shows the temperature profile sort of have a wave propagation behavior. So the question that we want to ask here is, what will be the wave and the behavior? What will be the speed and behavior for this propagating wave? Can we establish a physical model to describe? So this is the first study is basically we're assuming, say we have an infinitely large battery material. Somehow we trigger some runaway. And that reaction front is going to propagate in that material. And what will be the velocity and feature for this? By the postulation of this problem, you can say that it's very similar to flame propagation. But the only difference about this case is the battery material is largely condensed. Right? So that leads to extremely fast heat diffusion compared with very slow mass diffusion. So therefore, if you normalize the governing equation of energy and species concentration uh, conservation, and eventually you can find that this uh, Lewis number is approaching infinity. So this term describing the mass diffusion can be thrown away. So we're having a dominant process by heat diffusion and reaction, and also the reaction law. So, with these two ordinary differential equations, we can cancel the source term and come up with a conserved scalar. And using this conserved scalar and plug and plugging back to the equation for the dimensionless temperature, now we can have a second order equation that describing the evolving of the dimensionless temperature in the wave coordinate. Now we can use the large asymptotic, the large activation energy asymptotic analysis to solve this equation. It's basically if your activation energy is very large, that means your combustion phenomena is either limited in a very narrow region spatially, or it happens in a very short duration of time. So therefore we can consider your chemical reaction is only important in a very thin layer of the reaction tool. Beyond that reaction zone, this term, the effect of this uh, chemical reaction is negligible. So therefore you can solve this equation easily in the outer region without the effect of chemical reactions. And in the inner region of the chemical reaction, you assume that the solution is a dis distur disturbation based on the outer zone solutions. And eventually you assume the inner zone solution and outer zone solution, they will, their gradient will match at the boundary. That will give you the condition to derive the propagation wave speed. As a dimensionless parameter, as a function of dimensionless parameters theta and theta u. So the theta u is a dimensionless unburned temperature. The beta is like a dimensionless adiabatic temperature Access. And this theoretical model agrees with numerical simulation very well, especially when you have a, a uh, large normalized exothermicity. 
So more details can be found in this paper. And we further extend this theoretical study to spherical and cylindrical regions, which are having greater relevance. Because in the case of lithium battery thermal runaway, two typical scenarios will include first, you have a lithium plating a dendrite serving as hot spot that triggers like a hot spot induced thermal runaway. Or you might have a piece of metal like a nail penetrate a battery that, that, that can establish a cylindrical type of reaction wave. And the difference about this phenomena is they have different curvatures, therefore they have different heat flow. Right? So again, in this spherical and cylindrical coordinates, once we non-dimensionalize the governing equations and apply the large Zeldovich number symptotic analysis, we can obtain reaction front temperature as, uh, and the propagation velocity as a function of radius by solving these results. And that means your propagation of the thermal runaway has a C-shaped curve, which means it, start, it has a critical radius. Below this critical radius, no self-sustained reaction front exists. Beyond this critical radius, now you can see it can gradually propagate and eventually approaching the limit corresponding to a very large R. That's the planar limit. If you compare this critical radius between the spherical and cylindrical case, you can say that the cylindrical case has a slower, has smaller critical radius, which indicates the hot spot is easier to trigger some runaway in the cylindrical case. And this is because a spherical case has a stronger curvature effects, therefore has a stronger heat loss. So we further extend this theory based on combustion by, by adding a ignition source, basically at the center. Say so this is heat conduction, this is the ignition source. And now we can develop a unified theory of initiation and propagation. Basically now this, this equation, you will need to find a particular solution that satisfies this equation as well as this boundary condition. And we found that. And also we can similarly, we apply the large Zeldovich symptotic analysis. We can find out your reaction front temperature and propagation velocity as a function of both radius and ignition energy. But now you can see that the effect of the ignition energy quickly fades away. We have a very large R, right? So eventually this results approaches the case of propagation that we have already demonstrated. The interesting thing about the results in a spherical coordinate is now with the ignition energy Q, you have two branches, the initiation branch and also the propagation branch. We have very small ignition energy. These two branches are separated. But as you gradually increase the value of Q, you can see that these two branches are jointed. And that means you can have a successful trigger of thermal runaway, and this can jump directly from this point to the uh, propagation branch. So that means there is a minimum ignition energy, and in addition to the critical radius exhibits in a spherical case. But compared with the spherical case, the cylindrical case doesn't rigorously exhibit a minimum ignition energy because it can always have this S-shaped initiation regardless of what ignition energy you have. But as you can see that this branch might take infinitely long time to trigger some runaway because the velocity is very small. So therefore, if you still compare the branches of results that with similar features as this case, the cylind Cylindrical re results will still give you a lower minimum ignition energy, much lower compared with the uh, spherical case. So that means the nail penetration scenario is more dangerous compared with the local hot spot induced ignition because of lower curvature and heat loss. So 
the results is further justified by numerical simulations through collaboration with converged CFD. And where we have simulated thermal runaway initiation and propagation uh, in cylindrical and spherical regions with different hotspot sites. As you can see that among these four cases, only in a cylindrical cases with two millimeter can successfully trigger some runaway. And that basically because you have rather low curvature and rather large uh, critical radius that the two millimeter hotspot size is beyond its critical radius in a cylindrical re region. And also more recently, we're using numerical simulations to demonstrate the effects of venting combustion on thermal runaway propagation in a pet. And actually a very interesting behavior about thermal runaway is people actually compare the reaction heat from the thermal runaway reactions and combustion with the electrical energy stored in the battery. So that chemical reaction, rate, chemical reaction heat from thermal runaway and combustion can be as high as three times as high as the electrical energy stored in the battery, okay? So that means maybe this combustion process will play a bigger role compared with this electrical energy. So what we did is we select the five by five battery pack and we can open the vent at different places. And we can adopt the vent gas composition and the velocity from the literature measurement. And also we can use detailed chemistry to study the combustion of the venting gas through the gaps in this pack. And if you compare the case with combustion and without combustion, you can see that with combustion, you easily trigger some runaway during the two seconds of venting. So there can, Definitely there can be more uh, work that can be done about the thermal chemical modeling of thermal runaway and venting events. And that's a field that with lots of efforts recently. So in the second part, I wanna talk about experimental testing of thermal runaway. So my lab has the, the major equipment we have in the laboratory is called the EV Plus accelerating rate calorimetry, ARC. And this is equipment that allows you to do well-controlled thermal runaway testing under step heating, ramp heating, uh, nail penetration, overcharging, and internal shot circuit can conditions. So I want to primarily talk about the results we obtained through the classical hate weight sick strategy. As you can see that we suspend a cell using a thin metal wire in the middle of the chamber. Basically this is to allow the uniform heating from the heaters on top and side and bottom. And during this experiment, the initial period is a heating period where each time we heat up the cell by five Kelvins. At, a, at, at the end of the heating, we're going to wait and sick to basically ensure the cell and this chamber reaches thermal equilibrium. And then we start with the next heating step. And eventually until we find out a point where the cell starts to heat up by itself. And that's the onset of isothermicity, which is typically defined as 0 0.02 degree per minute. And starting from this point, the cell, the, the chamber will change its mode from heating to self-heating. Then the heater power basically is programmed in order to trace the temperature of the cell. In other words, at every time step, you will have a very close temperature between the chamber and the cell such that it can be seen as adiabatic. And eventually you will observe this thermal runaway behavior where the temperature uh, increase very fast. And for NMC and lithium cobalt oxide batteries, we can define the critical condition for thermal runaway as 20 degree per minute temperature rise rate. 
And for lithium phosphate batteries, we typically only use one degree per minute. The other thing you can say from this is, as you can see that at the onset of venting, then because of the flow caused by the venting, there is a cooling effect. So the temperature of the cell actually drops a little bit. That's induced by the, the venting cooling. With this strategy, we actually first utilize standard samples to calibrate the system many times. And we found that this, this experimental strategy is very uh, reliable and accurate. And then what we do in our first set, set of experiment is we're running the heat wick sick test for nine similar Samsung 18650 LCO batteries. The battery model is given here. They are all initialized following their menu using very low C rate. And as you can see that eventually have similar mass, similar voltage, similar capacity. And from their charging, discharging curve and impedance behavior, it's not going to be able to distinguish which one is which. And now we are doing this heat weight six summer runaway experiment for the nine cells one by one. As what you can see that the results is showing here, there is substantial difference between the summer runaway behaviors among the cells. The isothermicity onset temperature can be as low as 67 degrees Celsius, can be as high as 123 degrees Celsius. The summer runaway onset temperature also have some difference, although much smaller. The maximum temperature different, the maximum temperatures shows differences. The delay time between these two onset conditions also has big difference from as small as 121 minutes from as high as 1500 minutes. As you can see, there's a battery seven that even exhibit a two stage summer runaway behavior. Eventually you'll see that these cells, they all have different mass remained. That means they have different uh, injection of materials. So what this mean is these cells are even fresh cells from the same vendor. They have the same initial conditions, but there might be small manufacturing consistencies or some other damage that has been magnified during the summer runaway test that eventually they all have the different summer runaway behavior. So that basically means we cannot evaluate the safety of a battery just based on one or two tests. We have to do the evaluation based on a statistical behavior of multiple similar cells. And actually this variation can induce severe challenges about your modeling. Say for example, with the state of the art four step mechanism, we're not being able to capture the activation energy that's shown in this experiment. And this is an easy task to resolve because in combustion kinetics, we can typically tune the direction rate parameter to agree with a certain response, right? We just need to make sure if that the tuning is reasonable or can be extrapolated to other conditions. So this is an easier problem to resolve. A more challenging problem is you can have cells that with different, with similar onset temperature, but different summer runaway path. Eventually when you develop a model, you don't know readily which one you are going to select to validate your experiment. Even if you select one to validate experiment, that results can be misleading, right? So eventually what does indicate from the combustion perspective is we should consider the uncertainty of the chemistry. So if we consider the chemical reaction of a summer runaway can be represented by one step overall reaction. If we consider the uncertainty of the frequency factor A and also the activation energy, now we can obtain their the nominal values, the mean values, and also the standard error for both activity energy and frequency factor by analyzing the nine cells. 
And based on this uncertainty, now your model will have a, a lower limit and upper limit. Now you can see that your thermal runaway delay time is sort of in the middle of this uncertainty from the kinetics. Also the self-heating onset, thermal runaway onset also have a reasonable comparison with the kinetic uncertainty included, right? So this again emphasizes the fact that uncertainty quantification and statistical analysis is very important for thermal runaway tests. And that's a direct insight from combustion. And recently, by collaborating with Dr. Antonio Garcia from the University Polytechnic de Valencia, uh, we have conducted the optical diagnostics of battery venting and uh, of thermal runway fires. As you can see here that basically this is a chamber previously used for spray combustion. And also we can use a high-speed camera and slurring image to observe the venting events from the spray that generated by the venting. So as you can see that during the venting process, you can have a very complicated vending behavior that including gas, many particles, and even the large filament of uh, liquids right, or solid particles. And also following this very fast vending, there can be thermal runaway flames. And in this video, we're using the, uh, the we are capturing the chemiluminescence from the thermal runaway flames shortly after the vending events. And again, this battery is sitting here. As you can see, this flame gradually develops and it's largely a non-premixed flame. So this, the shape of the flame and also the length of the flame and the other features about flame can provide very useful targets to quantify numerical simulation for thermal runaway. So to fundamentally understand battery thermal runaway, we have to go deeper into the subcell level. Basically, we have to study the thermal stability of different battery components. And one major tool to study the, the Thermal stability of materials is a differential scanning calorimetry. It's basically where you can have uh, two, two crucibles. One is a reference crucible, one is a sample. And they are suffering from the same heating rate. But as there can be physical chemical transformation within the sample, so eventually when certain process happens, the sample temperature is going to deviate from the reference temperature. So by calibrating this temperature onset for the deviation, and also by calibrating this peak area with some using some uh, standard samples, we can calibrate the onset temperature and also the heat of transformation. And that's a working principle for the DSC. And people are using this equipment to study the to study the thermal stability of battery components. A major tool that can be utilized to analyze the DSC results and yield kinetic insights is called a Kinsinger method. It's basically if you consider this process either endothermic or exothermic is induced by a chemical process. You can write down this equation easily where alpha is a, nom is a, is a normalized chemical reaction progress. F alpha containing some reaction order effects. And this is Arrhenius term, and this is frequency factor. And by taking the derivative and also by considering that the temperature rise rate at the peak of the heat release or heat absorption is zero. And you can readily come up with the equation. And in the case where you have a unity reaction order, this long term is gone. And eventually you can have a very simple formula 
which is a Kinsinger results. But basically, if you can measure the temperature corresponding to the peak of heat release or absorption at a different heating rates of the experiment, you can extrapolate the activation energy, you can, extract, you can extrapolate the frequency effect. This method is very useful for simple materials that with a uniform, with a single peak or with separated peaks. And more recently, people use this to study the battery materials. As you can see that this in situ XRD will basically suggest there is a sequential transformation of the cathode material. They starting with the layered structure, it first becomes a first type spinel and then transforms to a second type spinel and eventually becomes some rock salt. So that means there can be coupling between the, the compositions of the, of the material at different temperature range through the heating process. So if people are using the NNC811 to do the experiment, as you can see, the opposite say that there are three peaks, which we assume relates with the transformation of this different structure. And if you consider that these peaks are independent, they are separated, you can individually using the Kinsinger method to deal with each one of them. And again, you can see that this separated reactions eventually agrees pretty well with the testing experiment and they are indeed following the process of one, two, and three. But however, if you take a look at another case, NMC622, now in this case, the first peak and second peak, they sort of overlap, they are merged. You almost cannot see the second peak. If you're still using three separate reactions to fit this DSC results of the material following the Kinsinger method, now you can come up with some misleading results. For example, your reaction two even occurs before reaction one which is not even possible because everything should start from reaction one that follows the first type spinel, and then the first type spinel becomes a second type, and then eventually become rock salt. So if we apply the Kinsinger method to battery material in general, especially when there are overlapped peaks, we can have the wrong physics and misleading results even if eventually the fitting agrees with the experiment. So by collaborating with Dr. Sili Den from MIT, we are using the chemical reaction neural network to solve this issue. It's basically, we know the physics in this process. There are three reactions and they are coupled, right? The coupling is through the first reaction generates the reactant for the second reaction. And the second reaction also generates the reactant for the third reaction. So therefore, using this chemical reaction neural network, you can see that each reaction is represented by a node. On the left-hand side, that relates with the concentration and temperature. On the right-hand side, it relates with the concentration and heat effects of that particular reaction. So eventually this, can be a very reasonable and physical neural network that describing our particular system, we including three reactions and including the correct coupling between reaction one, two, and three, and also the heat. So eventually, if you input, implement this in the, in the chemical reaction neural network, you come up with a well-defined optimization problem. The target is to select a set of the kinetic parameters that eventually can minimize the difference between the DSC results and also the, the simulation results. Right. So eventually you can see that by using the CRNN method to study the, the, uh, the, the aforementioned complex phenomena with two peak merging, and we still observe the correct physics where your first reaction is here, the second reaction is here, third reaction is here. They are decoupled. 
instead of the dash line where the second reaction occurs in front of the first reaction. And also that agrees with the temperature range as indicated by the in-situ XRP. So that's the cell level and sub-cell level experiments that I want to talk about. The last part is I want to talk about the mitigation of thermal runaway. So the question that I raise is a little bit different from the fire safety uh, community. It's that frequently when people talk about thermal runaway mitigation, what they mean is by extinguishing the fire induced by the thermal runaway so that there is no fire in the larger scale, right? But the question I, I ask is on a cell level, can we identify some effective warning signal where we can apply cooling and eventually we mitigate the thermal runaway. And meanwhile, we still save the functionality of the cell. So that is again done by using different uh, cells. We are using the lithium phosphate 18650 cells, A123 and JGNE. And you can see that they have similar charging discharging behavior, but they have different impedance. But no matter what, now we trace the temperature and the voltage evolution during the summer runaway. As you can see, that still observe the cell variations. But in addition to this cell variation in summer runaway, we also observe some good consistency. As you can see that some, sometime before the summer runaway, the voltage starts to drop. And the interesting thing about this voltage drop is they all corresponding to a similar temperature, 135 degrees Celsius. And this is not a magic number. And this actually corresponds to the melting down temperature of the separator, okay? And now based on this temperature and the voltage signal, the question is, can we define some warning signal where we can apply cooling to mitigate the thermal runaway and at the same time, we save the functionality of cell. And that's what we did. It basically, you can either select, say a temperature that is very close to 135 as a criterion. We select 130 degrees Celsius. Or you can directly select this voltage drop as a critical warning signal. Say when you receive the voltage drop, you apply cooling. Now for battery number two as shown in the red curve, and as soon as we observe there's a voltage drop, we start to turn on the fan. So some passive cooling is started. As you can see that this cooling is very slow. It takes about five hours to cool down the cell. And eventually during the cooling process, the voltage keeps dropping. And eventually this battery dies. And then let's take a look at battery number three because we think maybe battery two fails because the cooling was too slow. Now for battery number three, as shown in the black line, as soon as we, see, we observe there's a voltage drop, we apply liquid nitrogen cooling. The temperature drops sub, uh, simultaneously, almost immediately, okay? As you can see that there in the process, the voltage also has a very fast drop. Again, the battery number three also dies. So that means maybe the voltage drop is not a good signal. As soon as you observe a voltage drop, there is a strong damage that has been already been uh, existed inside of the cell. Now for the battery four and five, we apply cooling when the temperature is around 130 degrees Celsius. Say in the purple line, as soon as we have temperature reaching 130, we apply liquid nitrogen cooling which immediately cools down the cell. At the same time, the voltage remains. And we say, maybe at this point, we don't need liquid nitrogen cooling. So we just use nitrogen gas cooling for the battery number five when it reaches 130 degrees Celsius. As you can see that after very slow cooling, the voltage still remains. For all these cells, the thermal runaway starts about 100 degrees Celsius. At 130 degrees Celsius, there's already been a, a, some heat release from isothermic react. But eventually, as you can see, if we select the correct critical temperature, we are able to save the functionality 
of cell four and five. And also we compare the performance of cell four and five before and after saving from the thermal runaway test. What we found is internal resistance doubles, its, capacitance, uh, its capacity drops by 20%. Its voltage stays the same, but they both still function. Okay. So this is for LFP cells, which is a rather safe cell compared with NMC and LCO. For NMC and LCO, because the thermal runaway reactivity is so strong that the thermal stability of the separator is not a limiting step. Now, we cannot use the separator to basically to, to improve the safety by coming up with a better separator. And that, that also there are some trials that people have been found to prevent some around For example, people have tried using non-flammable electrolyte. But unfortunately, even if with non-flammable electrolyte, some around may still happens. That because the flame beta limit measures the chemical reaction between the electrolyte and oxygen. It doesn't prevent the, all the other side reactions, for example, lithium and electrolyte. And also recently there has been extensive interest in the solid state electrolyte. But no matter what material you say, they largely still have thermal runaway. And one of the leading mechanism is this metal oxide as ion conductor, they can decompose and release oxygen. And this oxygen will react with the lithium and trigger thermal runaway. So eventually, how can we prevent thermal runaway? I think the answer still lies in combustion. The answer lies in the ignition nature of thermal runaway is where for most combustion phenomena, we have this folded S curve at a suitable dumping number, and your ignition will happen, a companion with a large amount of heat release. And there can also be a special case where we don't have this floated aster. For example, we can have the stretched aster. This is known as mild combustion. And compared with this folded S curve, the stretch S curve is monotonic. It doesn't have the jumping from the lower branch to upper branch, it doesn't have hysteresis. And every time step, every step, every point might be a stable point, allows you to apply thermal management strategies and cooling. So eventually the key question here is, can we develop a cell whose thermal runaway behavior is a folded S-curve instead of a stretched one? And through some numerical simulations, we have shown that it's highly possible. So if you can reduce the reaction heat of the, the cathode and electrolyte, and also the reaction heat of the reaction of the electrolyte decomposition by one order of magnitude, you come with a purple line, where you can say it's almost achieved mild combustion. If you can further reduce the reaction heat of the anode and electrolyte reaction, you can say thermal runaway is nearly avoided. So I believe that the one ultimate solution for thermal runaway still lies in combustion, still lies in the ignition nature of the thermal runaway. So that's the last slide, uh, that's a conclusion. And also I want to thank the support from Ford Motor Company on thank my, my mentors over the years, Professor Sikri Law, Yi Guangzhou, Rolf Wrights, Andre Bayman, Xiao Wang, Feng Yuan Zhang, and also my graduate students involved in this work, and also lots of other collaborators. And also thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to address any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Congratulations for this very nice talk. Um, the paper is, I mean, the, the presentation now is open for questions. I'm going to see if there are already people um, ready for questions. So I see that there is a question on. Um, Ying, you can actually unmute yourself and ask the question if you want. Otherwise, I can read it. It's up to you.
Okay, so this question uh, that you can see in the chat. Um, um, okay, it's a rather long question. So, so yeah. this uh, regarding to the first part of presentation, modeling analysis of thermal runaway, uh, the similarity and a difference between combustion and thermal runaway. As those mentioned, methods like minimum emission, kinetic feature, charity on, look like all work in both fields. Question one is how did you connect these two topics, combining thermal runaway first? So as you said, as, as you mentioned, this is a great question. Okay, how do we connect combustion and thermal runaway? Is fundamentally thermal runaway is an ignition phenomenon and it involves a lot of combustion phenomena as well. For example, your venting gas generation and venting gas combustion. And if we consider the battery as a simplified material, so like homogeneous uh, condensed material, we don't consider the different layers, different surface reactions. Now we can have a much simpler way to describe its thermal runaway and come up with some qualitatively correct and meaningful results. For example, you can apply the minimum ignition energy. You can develop the hotspot induced ignition propagation theory. And that's what we did uh, by making simple assumptions. But if you want to further consider the detailed structure of the battery, the battery are heterogeneous. They are multi-layer. They include a multi-phase structure. A lot of thermal runaway reactions it actually happens on the interface. Right, so that basically gives you substantial difficult to measure and also to model. Then that will still need a lot of future work. Okay, and also as you can see that there can be differences between thermal runaway and combustion. For example, the cell variation. If you do a messing air benzene benzene flame, you know, in Belgium and in the U.S. We talk about the same mixture, same pressure, same temperature, we got the same results. But for the batteries, you know, your manufacturer inconsistency is un, in, un, un, inevitable. That's why we observe those kinds of thermal runaway variation among fresh cells that from same vendors. Question number two. Could you give some uh, more introduction on CFD of thermal runaway? Are there any specific difficulty in CFD? Yes. So, so I think a major difficult for CFD is about venting events. So, so the actual modeling of the venting is still very complicated. You know, uh, it involves the gas generation, gas accumulation, and pressure buildup in a cell, and also it, it involves, you know, what is a venting direction? What is the amount of venting gas? What's the venting composition? And also it involves say where that venting will have flame or only have smoke. So this is a very complicated process. There, there are good trials in different groups that are using either commercial software like Commazole, ANSYS, or they use uh, open source CFD like OpenFoam. I think all these platforms have their advantages that you might want to try to see if you can implement your model correctly. So that's my answer for your question. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Um, are there any other, is there any other question from the audience? Let's see. I had a question, so maybe sure. if, there is, if there is no question, I can ask one. Um, Please. Yes. Okay, so you you showed at a certain point the uncertainty of uh, predictions using UQ. Um, I was actually wondering about something which is related to that. So um, how do you manage the limit of the, let's say, the fact that the knowledge of the chemical kinetics might be, um, I mean, deficient in the sense that there might be pathways that are not uh, considered, let's say, in the model. Yeah, yeah, I understand your 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 question. Your question will be a it's a very valid question, especially for the combustion modeling. 
right? For example, you model some combustion process, you have a missing key pathway. Exactly. Yeah. No matter what you tune, you are going to be wrong. Okay, you have yes. a missing physics. But for the battery, I think still it's too complicated and its kinetics is still in the infant stage. We haven't be there yet. Yeah. We will be there someday. And unless we can know that, you know, how to model the battery correctly, for example, we include their different layer structures and include all these reactions between the in the elementary level and also uh, have the correct rates, I think there's still a long way to go. Yeah. So for simplicity, we are just using the one-step global reaction to perform the uncertainty. There can be other ways, but it's just for simplicity to demonstrate if we lump all the uncertainty from the variations in the kinetics, and that model is still very useful to yeah. explain the results. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, um, I think that your chemical reaction neural networks could actually help you in that discovery. Uh, but anyway, right. Uh, yeah. Salvatore, I saw that you are, you have raised end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, for your very nice talk. And my question is related, actually, to your question about you know the kinetics and. So I'm guessing that uh, you you don't have uh, an initial um, variability of your uh, kinetic parameters of the global reaction uh, rate. Initial variability. It's the, it's the, That's yeah, a great term. question. <laughs> that is actually a great great question. We do have that. So in the if you take a look at a, at, a, at the paper that I have the paper reference included on that slide, it's basically we are considering the reactant consumption during the heating stage, right? Because your arc has to heat it up step by step up to the temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. There might be already some consumption of reactant, right? So we did simulations using the four step and one step models to see what is the effect of that reactant consumption there. And it turns out that reactant consumption can have a, can have a, uh, some impact, but not too big impact on this uh, thermal runaway prediction, especially when we plot the results on the log scale. So, so eventually, you, as you can see that that curve that I'm showing on the cell variation has multiple curves. Some of them are considering the reactant. Yeah. Well, I guess it's, uh, then you have to include the, the variability of the react because you don't know actually the composition in because of manufacturing uh, yes. defects or yeah variability yes. so you have to take into account you have to lump yes. that into your yeah quantification that, of this yes. initial yes. variability yes so definitely so one way to uh, actually to mitigate those variations is people always using the normalized concentration in describing the reactants so i always start from normalized concentration of one, which is dimensionless, and say how that goes. Yeah. So, but, but, but again, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to, to, to make the thermal runaway kinetics as mature as what we do for combustion. There's still a long way to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other raised end. And then I will uh, actually take the opportunity to thank again, Professor Beng Zhao, Beng Zhao. And um, thank you again for the very interesting, uh, excellent talk. Uh, I, uh, I also invite all uh, the people online uh, to connect to the next uh, presentation that will be after advertised. And uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. And thank see you, you the, for the next one. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>